السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا أحدا فردا صمدا قيوما نؤمن له بالربوبية ونقر له بالعبودية من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كأفضل ما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على أوصيائه وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان وإيمان إلى قيام يوم الدين عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل ولزوم أمره قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة ومن يوق شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون and they prefer others over themselves even if they are impoverished and, who, and whoever is shielded from the avarice of his soul, it is they who shall prosper. Aminna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyu al-azim. The great Indian activists and civil rights leader, Mahatma Gandhi, requires no introduction. Most, if not all of us, have read about or heard of his life and his legacy. And for what he is most well known for, that is his role in leading to the independence and his inspiration of civil rights movements. And perhaps some of you have read about other aspects of his life and his legacy. Recently, I read a story from the life of Gandhi, a short story, and I found this story to be filled with lessons, several lessons from a very short instance, a short story from the life of Gandhi. We're told that one day Gandhi as he was attempting to rush to get onto a train that had began to move, in his rush to try to get onto the train, while he jumped on the train, one of his shoes fell from his feet onto the ground. And so Gandhi looked at his fallen shoe, then he kneeled down, he took off his second shoe and he threw it onto the ground next to the fallen shoe. So those around him, they looked at him and they asked him, they told him, why is it that you, sh you threw away or you threw your second shoe? Why did you just dispose of your shoe? He simply answered them. He told them, that there is no benefit for me with having one shoe. You want to have two shoes, the same kind of shoes. So there is no benefit in me holding on to this one shoe, whereas if I were to give, throw the other shoe, perhaps the person who comes across and is in need of shoes will be able to take advantage of both pairs of the pair of shoes, the two shoes together. Now, I don't know if this story is true or not, 
But regardless, in this powerful instance, we find that there are many lessons to be drawn. One of these lessons, my dear sisters and brothers, is the importance of not getting caught up with trivial matters and trivial issues. I remember several years ago when I was in the seminary in Qom, I went to my class one morning and the class was, that was held, it was a private class, it was held in one of the masjids, in the corner of one of the masjids in, in town, right across from the shrine of Lady Fatima al Masoom alayhi salam. And so I entered, of course, we entered, I took off my shoes, I put them in the shoe rack, and I entered, and I sat in there, I was there for a couple of hours, and after I finished my class, I came outside, and I was looking for my shoes, and I could not find them. They had disappeared. So I went, I continued to look, I looked in the shoe racks, I went to the other side, I kept walking around for several minutes. I went back and forth looking for my missing pair of shoes. I went outside. I looked around. Perhaps they had been outside the masjid, but I could not find them. I spent considerable amount of time looking for my shoes. And they weren't expensive shoes, but nonetheless, they were my shoes, and I was looking for them. Now, luckily, because the masjid is in the center of the city, I only had to walk a few steps and I went and I purchased another pair of shoes from a local store. But I remember that for a while, for a few days, this incident kept repeating in my mind. That I went to class, I left my shoes and suddenly they disappeared. And I spent considerable amount of time thinking about my shoes. Many times we find ourselves spending considerable amount of time and effort thinking about trivial issues, about a pair of shoes, or not being satisfied with some of the food that we have. We may go to a restaurant and we order a meal, and the meal comes and it's not a perfect meal. There's something wrong. It's a little cold. It's not hot enough. It does not taste good enough. There isn't enough salt or there isn't enough spices in it. And so I begin to complain. I make a big deal because the food is not perfect. It's not just right. I travel somewhere and, you know, I, I experience a little bit of delay in my flight or in my travels or during my commute to work or school, I experience you know, a delay in traffic, and I make a big deal out of it. I spend extra time and effort over a small issue, over a trivial issue. Unfortunately, we find ourselves sometimes preoccupied with what we call first world problems. Things that are trivial. That if we were to go up and take a 30,000 foot view, they would become so insignificant compared to some of the things that are happening in the world. Yet we find ourselves often preoccupied in very small issues. Whereas here in this story, Gandhi, let's go. It's just a pair of shoes. You can get another pair. It's not worth for us to spend time and effort over trivial issues, brothers and sisters. When we do so, we take away the effort and the capacity that we have to focus on things that are more important. Because our capacity, our strength, our patience, no matter how great we are, is limited. No one is unlimited in their patience. No one is unlimited in their strength and their efforts. So it's important that we think about how we can prioritize spending our effort, spending our time, whether it's thinking about things or engaging in behavior, that we prioritize so that we expend our efforts in those things that are truly valuable and truly worth it. 
So this is one lesson. Thinking about the importance of not getting preoccupied or caught up with trivial matters. Another lesson, brothers and sisters, from this short story from the life of Gandhi is not to get too upset with our losses. And this is related to the first issue. Not to get too upset with our losses. And at the same time also, not to become overly joyous with our gains. And this is a major lesson that the Qur'an gives us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ That on the one hand, you do not despair, you do not enter into a state of despair over the things that you lose, over your losses. But on the other hand, that you also do not become overly joyous and happy with your gains. Why? Why is it that the Qur'an calls us towards this sense of moderation? Because the Qur'an wants to remind us that this life that we live in, and everything that we witness and we experience within this life is temporary. The difficult and the bad is temporary, and so is the good and the happy. They come and they go. Nothing remains forever. Nothing remains eternally. The difficult days, they come and then they go. Allah says, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ with difficulty comes ease. And then those moments of ease, they come for a short period of time. They are also followed by difficult moments. I read a story once about a man who lived uh, you know, on the hillside, lived a very simple life. And he had in possession of his a horse, a single horse. And so one day he woke up and he went out into his farm and this horse had run away, it had escaped. And so when his neighbors found out about this, they came to him and they tried to, you know, console him and, you know, keep him, down, uh, keep him up, you know, sort of offer their condolences, we're sorry that you lost your horse, your only horse. You know, what, what sort of bad luck that you have, that you've la lost your single, your only horse. So the man turned to them and he simply told them, he said, who tells you that this is bad luck? For me to lose my horse is bad luck. A few days later, the man woke up and he noticed that his horse had come back. It had returned and accompanying this horse were several other wild horses. And so when his neighbors found out about this, they came to him and they congratulated him. They told him, what great luck you have. You lost a single horse. Not only did it come back, but it brought with it a group of horses. Some more horses. What beautiful luck you have. So he turned to them and he told them, what makes you think that this is good luck? A few days passed and this man's adolescent son was training one of the horses. He ended up falling off the horse and breaking his leg. So the neighbors, when they heard of the news, they came to the man and they told him, we're very sorry to hear about this bad luck that you have. Your son fell off the horse and he broke his leg. We're very sorry for this. What unfortunate luck you have. He told them, how do you know that this is bad luck? We're told that a few days passed and that area that they were living in suddenly decided to declare war. And so there was a recruitment of all of the young men in town. Yet because this man's young son had broken his leg, he was exempt from joining the army and joining the battle which resulted in the death of a lot of young people. 
And so this story continues with the man. And in fact, this story continues in all of our lives, brothers and sisters. That we have days of ups and days of downs. We have days of happiness and we have days of sadness. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam, he says, yawmun laka wa yawmun alayk. One day is for you and one day is against you. This is life. And those who are wise are those who realize this. They understand the temporal nature, the transient nature of this life and the transient nature of their experiences in this life, both the good and the difficult. And so this is a, a lesson that we learn, that we do not get too upset with our losses and not too proud and too overly joyous with our gains. This is number two. A third lesson that we learn from this short story from the life of Gandhi is that it is important for us to live based on principle and values, not based on urges and desires. It's very easy for us in our lives sometimes to make compromises. We compromise <clears throat> our ethical, our religious values, our spiritual values. When it comes to certain expediencies, a certain opportunity, we consider it an opportunity arises for me, for instance, to make a few extra dollars, to gain in my business, to gain in my position, to gain in any other aspect of my life. And so I am faced with a choice to make. This opportunity may come at the expense of my values and my principles. I may have to you know, cheat in order to make that few extra dollars. I may have to bend the rules in order to get ahead. And so I am faced with a choice, an, an important choice to make. Do I compromise my values and my principles in order to please my urges and my desires? Or do I stand firmly? Do I live firmly according to my values and principles? And I do not compromise under any circumstances. For Gandhi, this was an easy answer. For him, he could have held on. He could have said, this is my shoe. Yes, I lost the first one, but the second one is mine and I will keep it because this is my shoe. It belongs to me. Why should I give it away to anyone else? Yet he was able to put aside his urges and his desires and to stand firmly for his values. When I value things like helping others, when I value things like, when I have values such as respecting others, such as integrity and truthfulness and respect, then these are values that I am to adhere to in all situations and in all circumstances. I have to struggle not to allow myself to compromise these values for the pursuit of my urges and my desires. And this is the essence of faith, brothers and sisters. Faith, we know, is not just something that we utter, something that we profess by our tongues. The essence of faith is a commitment. The essence of faith is to be committed to certain values and to certain principles. For us to be able to struggle for these values and for these principles. This is why the tradition focuses and encourages us on this inner jihad, on this inner struggle. It's a constant struggle. It's not something that falls from the sky. It's not something that happens overnight. But for us to be truly faithful, for us to have true iman, is for us to be able to struggle on a daily basis. Because sometimes we may assume that faith is composed of doing big things, grand things. If I'm able to spend my days entirely in worship, if I'm able 
to fast every single day, to pray during the night, to give all of my wealth to charity, to go to Hajj and Ziyarah every year, and to do all of these things, some people assume that faith is only through these grand things. But the essence of faith, when faith is truly tested, is with those things that we consider to be small, our daily challenges. Our daily challenges, the ways that we interact with our family members. Am I committed to respect? Am I committed to respecting my parents? Am I committed to respecting my spouse, my children? Am I committed to respecting others? If I stand for respect, if respect is for me important, do I incorporate re respect in my own life on my daily interactions? When it comes to integrity and truth, do I incorporate this in my daily actions and interactions? This is the true test of faith. Whether we are committed or not, whether we are able to constantly struggle or not. This is the third and the final and fourth lesson is for us to think about the ways that we can turn trials and challenges into opportunities. In this case, in this example that I gave from the life of Gandhi, he took this challenge, he lost his shoe, one shoe, right? He took this challenge for him, this loss for him, and he transformed it into an opportunity. He transformed it into an opportunity for someone else. He lost his shoe, so he threw the second shoe so that someone else who is in need can take advantage of this pair of shoes. This was a challenge for him, a test for him, that he transformed into an opportunity. And so it's important for us to think of the ways that we can transform our challenges, our trials into opportunities. Sometimes the tests that we face, we can take as an opportunity to strengthen our faith with God. Sometimes we are in need of being, of being woken, right? I've mentioned this example previously, that when you drive on the freeway, you notice on the sides of the freeway, the left and the right side, the rumble strips, right? The whole point of having a rumble strip is for it to wake you in case you're falling asleep behind the wheel and you begin to swerve to go off direction, the rumble strips shakes you, it wakes you. Sometimes God tests us with challenges and trials to wake us because we are entering into a state of slumber. We begin to forget and as human beings, we constantly forget and we constantly require reminders. So sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us to wake us up, to make us realize once again, this could be an opportunity for me to rediscover my identity, to rediscover my relationship and my bond with God, to rediscover my relationship with others, to rethink my life, my objectives, my priorities, where I am and where I'm headed. Sometimes our tests and trials are an opportunity for us to reach out to others and to help others to think about our commitment towards others. And thus it becomes important for us, my dear sisters and brothers, that we think about, it is difficult for us to think of ways in which we can transform our trials and tests into opportunities, but this is not something that is impossible. It is not something that is impossible. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the capacity to turn towards those things which please Allah and away from those things that displease Allah and to make us agents of positive change in our lives and in the lives of others. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr. إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صلوات أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه على آلائه ونعمائه 
ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كأفضل ما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على أوصيائه وأهل بيته وعلى علي أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين وعلى البضعة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وعلى سبط نبي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب أهل الجنة وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الحجة المهدي أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل ولزوم أمره قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان and help one another toward piety and reverence and do not help one another toward sin and enmity آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم You may have noticed in recent news that the United States Senate is currently moving to end U.S. support for the disastrous war in Yemen led by Saudi Arabia and other countries in the region. And this came or is occurring in the wake of the recent news that I'm sure you're all of familiar with of the horrendous murder and dismemberment of the Saudi dissident and journalist Jamal Khashoggi. This event has caused many nations around the world to rethink their relationship with countries such as Saudi Arabia and others. And it must be said, brothers and sisters, that despite how horrendous the killing of this journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, was, despite how horrendous and tragic this event was, it is sad to say, it is sad to say that this murder is what is causing nations around the world, including our nation, to rethink our relationship with countries such as Saudi Arabia, especially when it comes to this disastrous war in Yemen that for the past several years has caused massive destruction, has caused the loss of thousands of innocent lives, that according to many reports is the worst humanitarian disaster in the world today. Of course, the Qur'an reminds us that the killing of one innocent person in the eyes of God is like the killing of all of humanity. And so this is not to lessen from the impact of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, but to remind us that when it comes to values, unfortunately, when it comes to some of the principles that we espouse that we only come to realize them when it is beneficial for us. That when it comes to the case of the poor people of Yemen, which before the war was the poorest Arab country, the poorest Arab country, and since then for the past several years has become a complete land of destruction with disease widespread, with countless people who have died, with countless people who have, forced, who have been forced to flee from their homes, that it takes such a situation for us to rethink. Now despite this, this is a commendable act, brothers and sisters. It's been important and in fact, several officials have for years been on the front lines 
in calling for the end of U.S. support to the Saudi-led aggression against Yemen. But this, we pray that this action will move forward and that it will result in our end for this tragic support, the support of the destruction against the people of Yemen. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, this is not new. Our government support for dictators, for tyranny, for destruction and oppression is not something that is new. In fact, the war on Yemen did not begin just today or last year. It began with the previous administration. And it's been continued for several years. And the war on Yemen is the latest in a series of our government and our country's support for dictators and for oppression around the world. We have a long history of this type of support, which is very tragic and which goes against every value and every principle that we espouse publicly into the world. Do we not consider our country and our nation to be the leader of the free world? That country that calls for and stands up for human rights? That country that calls for and stands up for liberty and freedom and justice? But unfortunately, in many cases, our actions, they go contrary to those values and those principles that we espouse. And thus it becomes imperative for us to remind our elected officials and representatives that the greatness of a society, the greatness of a country, what makes a country and a nation and a society great is not that it spends time and effort and money into accruing military and economic strength. This is not what makes a country strong. This is not what makes a country great. Not that we have a huge army or that we have a great economy and that we have all sorts of strength. What makes a society and a country and a nation strong and great is the way that it deals with its own citizens and the citizens around the world. What makes it great is whether it stands firmly for the principles and the values that it espouses or not. And history tells us, brothers and sisters, history tells us very clearly that those nations, those communities that stand up for those good values are those that remain great. And those that do not, they are those that lose. They are those that are not great. And so it's an imperative for us to remind ourselves and to remind our officials the importance of standing up, truly standing up for our values. Not to profess something, but to go and to contradict these professions with our acts, with destruction. The Quran reminds us, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Help each other, support each other with goodness, with righteousness. If there is a righteous cause, then come and support one another. Stand firmly with one another. And if God forbid there is an evil cause, that we do not help one another when it comes to evil. We do not support one another when it comes to evil. وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Do not support others when it comes to aggression, when it comes to oppression, when it comes to injustice, when it comes to wrongdoing. Do not support one another. And this is a lesson for us brothers and sisters. Not just on a global or international level, but also even within our own lives. And as I mentioned in the first khutbah, for us to profess something, for us to suggest that it is important for us to stand up for our values and principles and to ask others to do so, we have to be ready to do so ourselves. We cannot expect the world to become a better place if we ourselves are not ready to stand up for our own values and our own principles. And thus, it's important for us to think about how we can also 
come together in support for good causes and that we do not support one another when it comes to wrongdoing and immoral causes. Peace and justice will come only if we are able to, in our individual lives and our communal lives, stand up for the values, remain committed and true to the values that we espouse. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to bring his relief and to his comfort and his comfort to those who are oppressed all around the world. We pray to Allah to make us agents of positive change in our lives and in the lives of others. We ask Almighty Allah to make us to open up our hearts to those things that please God and away from those things that displease God. We pray to Allah to bestow his peace upon those who are sick and those who are ill and to bless the souls of all of those who have died, the mu'mineen and the mu'minat all around the world. We pray to Allah to bestow peace upon their souls and to grant their families and their friends patience and to grant us all strength. We pray to Allah to hasten the reappearance of our final Imam Al-Hujjat ibn Al-Hasan Al-Mahdi Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Wal-Asr Inna Al-Insana Lafi Khusr إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر قوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله